Asian swamp eels belong in Asia, but in the mid to late 1990s, someone must have tossed two or more into a canal near Miami. And someone else must have done the same near Tampa. It was the beginning of the invasion of Florida waters by this non-native eel-like fish. The swamp eels don't belong here, but they didn't care. They reproduced and colonized any creek, pond, swamp, or drainage ditch they could get to. So now we have another unwanted alien species in our ecosystem that is probably here to stay. The swamp eels got to Cypress Creek near my local nature trail just east of Tampa Bay, although I didn't know it until I learned it from the white ibis that you see staging here above the bridge that runs over the creek. Across the bridge from the nature trail, there is an interesting swale or depression on the edge of the golf course that fills with water after long heavy rains. Because the water comes and goes, and the swale is more often dry than wet, nothing lives there that can't leave or survive buried in the bottom soil when the swale is dry. And when there is a lot of water in it, the swale drains to the creek under the bridge through this big pipe. Usually there's no more than a trickle of water through the pipe, and keeping our swamp eels in mind, the pipe's end at the creek is not close enough to the usual level of creek water for fish to get to it. But one year, after some very heavy rains, the creek at the bridge rose to the top of the dam. There was hardly a difference in water level between pond and creek. That's the top of the dam the heron is trying to walk across, just for fun, I like to imagine. The flooded creek below the dam was so high that it filled the big pipe that drains the swale into it. A contingent of adventuresome swamp eels swam from the creek through the pipe to the flooded swale. Being nocturnal fish, they probably did it at night to escape the heron. But nevertheless, the journey was a bad decision. When the water receded, they were trapped there. But they knew what to do about it. They burrowed into the mud and breathed there. They're not true eels, but they are fish with a V-shaped gill under the head. Unlike most fish, they have a specialized section in the mouth that absorbs oxygen from the air. As long as a buried swamp eel stays moist, it can survive for weeks or months until the water comes again, unless somebody eats it. So back to the ibis. Sometimes they act like proper wading birds feeding on crayfish frogs and other little water animals. But around here, you're likely to see them nowhere near the water, often crowds of them poking holes in golf courses and lawns. Sometime after the big flood, when the water in the swale had drained away, I noticed the ibis hunting there. They probe the soil and by feel alone get little soil animals like worms, grubs, and beetles. Hors d'oeuvres, you might say. But every now and then, there's an entree or a main course. I think it was a surprise. The swamp eel's cover was blown. The ibis rooted out the alien invaders. They couldn't send them home, so they ate them. And when they realized what was down there, the rush was on. The swamp eels don't bite. Their tiny teeth are no good for defense. But it looks like they're not so easy for an ibis to eat, especially the big eels. 
The bird has to get the head end in first. That can be hard to do until the eel's muscles are exhausted and it stops all that thrashing. Looks a little uncomfortable for the bird, doesn't it? Better not think about how the eel feels. Let's assume it's quickly killed by the hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes in the bird's stomach. Ibis and many other carnivorous birds don't have a well-defined second stomach, a gizzard, that mashes up hard materials. Instead, the indigestible hard parts like shell and bone are accumulated and regurgitated as pellets. The small intestine continues to break down the soft parts and then absorbs the nutrients into the bird's bloodstream. The waste is quickly expelled through the cloaca, and so fish becomes bird. The entire swamp eel is likely to be digested in no more than a couple of hours. Flying birds need to be light. They process their food quickly and quickly expel the waste. In the trees above, a pair of red-shouldered hawks is watching the ibis with uncharitable intent. What they can't catch, they can steal. Some days later, at the low end of the swale, just before the pipe, here's a family of sandhill cranes. They don't find any eels. There may not have been any in this section, but the cranes are not fish eaters and might not have taken an eel even if it came up and looked at them. Another time at the creek, when the water's low and there's little or no current, the invasive floating fern Salvinia has covered the surface like a green lawn. Late in the afternoon, a black-crowned night heron is on the hunt. There are still fish down there, including the swamp eels, who don't mind stagnant, oxygen-poor water. The crafty bird vibrates its bill in the water to attract curious fish. Will it work on a swamp eel? On another day, something worked, but I didn't see how the bird did it. Not an easy dinner. This was a long, drawn-out struggle between fish and bird. I give you an abbreviated version here. The serrated edges of the bird's bill let it hold the slimy eel, but unlike the ibis on land, it better not let the eel drop or it might not be able to get it again. Better get out of the water, buddy. There are alligators here, and they're attracted to commotion in the water. Don't drop the eel now, or it's goodbye, Charlie. I guess we have to decide whose side we're on. Sorry if you're rooting for the eel. Gravity-defying skill, it manages to get the head end up. That last quick move by the heron does it. The head is up, but the end is near. It was quite a workout for the heron, much more than it needs for the kind of fish it usually catches. But isn't this one too big? I guess not. It has an expandable esophagus with lubricating glands and muscles that move the fish downward.
It's not only the birds that catch the swamp eels. Here's an otter with one from the same creek. I'm sure the alligators like them too. They probably get them at night when both are most active. How did the swamp eels get here? They're a popular food for people in parts of Asia. And now, thousands of the live swamp eels are being flown into the U.S. from South and Southeast Asia. Most go to ethnic fish markets, but a few to chain supermarkets. A smaller number are for the aquarium trade. The problem then is that people let them go. Some of the released swamp eels are unwanted aquarium pets. Others escaped or were released from fish farms or fish markets, and it's thought many are or were from Buddhist life-release rituals, in which animals destined for slaughter or a life in captivity are purchased and then compassionately let go as a way of gaining spiritual merit. Not so good for the environment. When alien animals are released in Florida as well as elsewhere and become established in the wild, they almost always cause problems. This environmentally unfriendly practice is now being curtailed by many Buddhist groups. How bad is the swamp eel invasion? We now know it can be very bad. A study at Taylor Slough in the Everglades illustrates this. The researchers found that the populations of two species of crayfish in the slough dropped 99% since the eels invaded the area. At least four species of small fish there also lost much or most of their population. These were food for many native animals. The breeding success of wading birds is likely to decline as a result. As the swamp eels continue to expand their range, it's feared they will do as much damage to Everglades wildlife as the Burmese pythons have done. The swamp eels have joined the growing crowd of alien wildlife in Florida. We fight some of the invaders, but most of them are probably here to stay. And if Taylor Slough is an example of what to expect, Neither alligators nor other predators are likely to keep the swamp eel population in check.